Congo is one of the richest countries in Africa. It is endowed with immense mineral wealth. It has copper, cobalt, uranium, gold, diamonds, you name it, Congo has it. When its collapse began in 1994, when Mobutu Sese Seko left office, Congo kind of went up for grabs. And those who lived in those rich mining areas were the ones who seemed to suffer the worst. They used to use the local population to, to mine for them, almost like slaves, and then take the gold from here and ship it out towards Uganda. And then from Uganda it went to, to Europe and was traded on the international markets. These are people who should be rich, who should be benefiting from the gold. And of course they're not. Local groups were saying to us, people are being massacred, women are being raped, people are being killed because of our mineral resources. Congo is a huge country and it's a mess, it's chaos. And there are some five million people who have lost their lives as a result of the conflict that has taken place there. And it's a complicated conflict um, involving not simply the Congolese army, but a proliferation of, of local rebel groups, many of them backed by neighbors of Congo, including Rwanda and Uganda. There were several foreign armies in Congo. There were close to nine countries involved. You have militias, you have armed groups, who are accountable to nobody. The first and most fundamental step that Human Rights Watch takes to make change in a place like Congo is to establish the facts. Excusez-nous pour le dérangement. To establish facts on the ground is absolutely essential. When I go and do these investigations, I talk to dozens and dozens, sometimes many more, witnesses, eyewitnesses, victims, trying to piece together exactly what happened who was responsible, and what needs to be done to change it. The most important thing here is you're talking to people who, in some ways, cannot do anything about what has happened to them. They cannot get the justice that they, that they seek, and they need someone else to do that for them, someone else to provide the voice for them, and that's what this work actually entails. That was a, like a... Like a crushing of the skull? Yeah, it was like a... The fighting is really revived intensively um, in, in, in the last year or so. And people suddenly realize that there is the risk of massive bloodshed again, massive killing, massive rape. And a critical role that Human Rights Watch plays is that of sounding the, the warning bell, sounding the alarm, making clear that there is an, a rise in atrocities and it, now is the time to act to curb them. There is one constant in Congo. Every time the bullets fly, every time armed groups fight, it is civilians who pay the price. Over Christmas this year, the Lord's Resistance Army, also known as the LRA, a rebel group from Uganda, went into parts of northern Congo while people were eating or finishing their Christmas dinner, and they massacred them. We immediately got on a small plane and went to this remote corner on the border with Sudan, and then found the witnesses. One led us to another to another. Here in the town of Faraj, they waited till everyone had finished their church services and then they attacked the town, killing people brutally with axes and with bats to the head, basically crushing their skulls. Um, our researchers are trained intensively over the years so that even where there are warring factions and people may hate the other side, they learn how to cut through the tendency to lie or exaggerate or, or color the facts and to get at what actually happened. We were able to gather first-hand, fresh evidence about these massacres just days after they happened. Yes, 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 We made lists and names of the people who'd been killed, the people who survived. We took that information both directly to policymakers by calling them up, by knocking on their doors. And we also, of course, took the information to the press. We're taking photographs of people that can then be distributed to newspapers and magazines all over the world. We're taking video that's going on international broadcasting stations. I think the great strength of Human Rights Watch is to call the attention of the world on a conflict that was essentially ignored, where the international community wanted to look the other way. 
One thing we were able to do is to convince the UN Security Council to deploy additional peacekeepers and to give those peacekeepers the means and the mandate to begin to protect civilians. I was just in Congo over the summer, and I went principally to look at the explosion of rape and sexual violence committed this time not only by the rebel groups, which people are almost accustomed to now, but increasingly, indeed a majority of the time, by the army. We went to try to stop that. Congo is probably one of the worst places in the world to be a woman or a girl. 200,000 women and girls have been raped in Eastern Congo since 1998. <laughs> Many of the women had fallen pregnant because of the rape and they had been thrown out of their homes. What do you say to this young girl whose life has been destroyed because of rape? Annika von Wuttenberg has talked so extensively, in such detail, over so many months and years, to so many hundreds, if not thousands of people, just ask them the simple question, what happened to you? What did you suffer? When? Who did it to you? Just the basic questions. Human Rights Watch repeatedly brought evidence to the table which emphasized the real scale of the problem. We've been working on this for years now. Our first report on sexual violence in Congo, the war within the war, was way back in the early 2000s, and we have kept at that issue. What was important is that Human Rights Watch was able to gather testimony that clearly illustrated that the rapes that were happening were not individual soldiers going off, that this was a systematic campaign against a civilian population. No one likes to be known as a human rights abuser. And so when Human Rights Watch researchers can uncover the facts, when we can document abuses, that information is powerful. Les soldats de l'armée congolaise ont eux aussi perpétré des crimes de guerre contre les civils. We reported that the army itself is responsible for the majority of the rape today. But the most important thing we did was we met with President Kabila. And two days later, the Congolese army announced a zero-tolerance policy for rape, exactly what we had asked Kabila to do. The issuing of the decree by President Kabila is an extraordinary achievement because that decree is not going to stop rape altogether, but it will send a very powerful message that the most important man in Congo is saying, this is not okay, it is unacceptable. It's not just government uh, leaders and government officials who are eager to avoid being named and shamed by Human Rights Watch. It's even rebel commanders. This grainy clip of film is at the heart of a trial at the International Criminal Court, which accuses the Congolese militia leader Thomas Lubanga of recruiting and training child soldiers. Well, the International Criminal Court is the court of last resort. So that means that if there are no national proceedings, then the International Criminal Court can take up the case. Thomas Lubanga is the first that this new concept... Human Rights Watch indeed collected evidence about Thomas Lubanga's use of child soldiers, his rebel group's use of child soldiers. And we handed this information to the International Criminal Court prosecutor that led ultimately to the prosecution of Lubanga, the fact that he's on trial today. He has committed certain of the most grave crimes I was in northern Congo when the trial opened in the town of Bunya, which is where so many of the atrocities had taken place. And I sat amongst a, a group of four or 500 people crammed into this tiny church hall as we watched the images come across from what was happening in the trial. And it was one of those extraordinary moments when I saw justice starting to work. It gives a message to the people that, look, these warlords, they will be held to account. They are deflated. They are afraid of being brought to The Hague. Ending impunity is a key because we have found that in the past where um, serious crimes have not been addressed, the same perpetrators have come up again and perpetrated or carried out or committed further atrocities. By collecting information, by putting pressure on the actors, we can force them step by step 
to curb the atrocities and to begin to put in place the systems, the rule of law, that will help to prevent a recurrence of these atrocities. There's something about Congo that pulls me back again and again and again. It breaks my heart and yet it gives me immense hope. Congo is a horrible and yet a wonderful place. And I think we have to do all we can to keep telling the stories of what is happening there.